summer that I was going to turn eight years old, I think it was 1971, our family moved from the city to the country in uh, the Aurora Donald area in Oregon. And the house we bought, uh, there it was a rental house before we bought it. And so we took our first load of uh, stuff to move in our Volkswagen van and we show up to the house to start moving in. And the family that was renting the house hadn't moved out yet. So there was a bit of a confrontation there and, uh, and they must have like four or five kids and we had five kids at the time. And so while my stepdad was arguing with their father and mother that they should be out, one of the kids kind of took me off to the side that was living there and told me, look out for that big black thing that comes around at night. And I was like, what? Like Black Panther? I don't think there's any Black Panthers around here, but anyway, so we ended up moving in and I was scared as heck to live there. I cried every night. I was afraid of the house. Um, my mom didn't know what to do with me. And she was gonna send me down to the Roseburg area to live with my grandma and I said, I'll go. And then she said, no, you're not going. And, and, uh, and then I started having scary dreams at night that this big hairy arm was reaching through the window trying to find me. And so I was having nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. And the place really freaked me out. One time I took my little brother who was six years younger than me out to our woods. It was actually our neighbor's woods and we were pushing these little small trees over and and as we made it through the woods a little ways we heard a bigger small tree crash over and it freaked us out really bad and so we took off running and and uh i don't know if i was thinking bigfoot or anything at the time we were just scared and then at, at some point i made friends with the neighbors and we went to the movie theater in Woodburn. It was called the Pix Theater. And this was like, you know, 1971, I guess. I, I think that's when they released the Patterson Gimlin film clips to show at the theaters. And so I'm there with like uh, three of my friends and we're sitting there and they show the Patterson Gimlin film clip. And I instantly was like, it's real, that's real. And all my friends were laughing at me. And so I caught hell for that. They teased me. My, well, to this day, they still tease me that I believe in Bigfoot. But the minute I saw the PG film clip, I I was like, yep, it's real. And then, I don't know, I think some things started kind of making sense after that. And so that's kind of how it all started. So our old farmhouse was haunted. It was built in the early 1900s, I think like around 1915. And a doctor, the doctor of that area actually lived there and I think he treated patients there too. And, and so the house was always really scary to me and we, we all kind of knew it was haunted, but out of us four kids that were living there at the time, we never really shared our stories about what we saw until later on. Two older sisters shared a bedroom together in the old farmhouse. They used to get woken up at night from a old woman ghost that would be staring at them watching them sleep and they'd wake up and they'd look up and there'd be this old woman well we called her aunt edna because back in the day uh, uh there was a lady named aunt edna who lived in the house and we actually had found an old photograph of her standing on the side of the house uh and it was actually on the side of the house where the second floor up is where my sister's bedroom was and my sisters saw the photograph and they're like, yeah, that's who we see at night sometimes. So fast forward a few years, my stepdad and mom got divorced and my mom moved out and took my little brother and little sister with her. And I didn't want to leave the house. I was like, no, this is my house. I'm, I'm staying. So I stayed with my stepdad who was a traveling salesman. He was gone a lot during the week. So I basically lived there by myself from like summer all the way till about Thanksgiving. Well, uh, one night um, I was sleeping in my sister's bedroom because it was the biggest bedroom up there, upstairs. 
and I w was trying to go to sleep, and I um, always tried to go to sleep with, a, I always had to have a radio on or the TV on because the house made a lot of weird noises, and I'd get freaked out if I hear, heard something creak. So, but this one particular night, it was right around Thanksgiving, I said to myself, you know what, I'm not gonna let this house get to me. I'm turning off the TV, I'm turning off the radio, this house is not gonna get to me. The house is not gonna win. So, everything was silent, and I'm laying there trying to go to sleep, and that's when I hear what sounds like scratching on the side of the house. The same spot where the picture of Aunt, Ed, where Aunt Edna stood in the picture. It sounded like somebody had a rake and they were scraping the side of the house, which was right below the window where the bed was I was sleeping in. And I kind of freaked out, so I went into my actual bedroom that my brother and I had shared, into the closet, and I pulled out a baseball bat and went to, went to go back to my bed. And outside the window was this blue glowing object, like if you put a black and white TV out there and it just had, you know, fuzz on it or whatever. And it, it was a blue glowing type looking light. So I freaked out. I ran downstairs. We had one phone in the entire house with a cord about that long and you had to dial it. And so I called my mom. Nobody answered. Called my grandma. Nobody answered. I called the neighbors. Nobody answered. It, or, or I can't remember if it was busy or nobody answered. But I couldn't get through to anybody. Finally called my grandma again. And she just lived about four miles away at the time. And she said, oh, no, your mom was just here. She should be home now. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just sleep on the floor uh, next to the phone in case I freak out. I'll, at least I'll be by the phone. But before I, before I tried to go back to sleep, I turned all the outside lights on and all the inside lights I turned off. And I could still hear the scraping on the side of the house. And that was the same room that I was gonna sleep in next to the phone. Well, I got brave. On the other side of the house was a sliding door that went to a deck where the hot tub was. I opened up the door and I stuck my head out and I could hear the scratching from around the house. I could still hear it. And I'm like, okay, that's a real sound, you know, it's really there. And so I locked the sliding door, um, grabbed a pillow and a blanket, and decided I'm gonna sleep right by the phone. And, and then uh, I'm laying there and I'm right below the room that I had been sleeping in. And all of a sudden I can hear the closet door sliding open really slowly up in, the gro in my sister's old bedroom. And it, I could hear it opening up and then I could hear somebody walking across the floor and I could almost imagine where the footsteps were landing as it walked. I, it probably w took about five steps or something. I freaked out and I ran into the laundry room, had my backpack, I threw some clothes in it and we had this, uh, uh, an old car, it was in like an old 64 Chrysler 300 that just sat in the driveway and uh, we weren't supposed to drive it. I don't think it was insured or something. Anyway, I grabbed the keys. I jumped over the hot tub deck uh, fence, ran out to the car, and I jumped in there, and I'm like, going, rrr, rrr, rrr. and I had just seen the movie The Shining not too long before that. You know, so I'm just imagining, here's Johnny you know, coming after me. So I freak out, and finally the damn thing starts. I take off, and I cruise to the truck stop. I had $4 in my pocket. I put eight gallons worth of gas in, <laughs> uh, or $4 worth of gas in, and cruised to Hubbard to my mom's apartment. Well, my older sister uh, was, in, was visiting for the holidays from college, and she was staying at my mom's apartment. And she's one of my sisters who had the Aunt Edna sightings at night, the ghost uh, of Aunt Edna. Well, anyway, the old Chrysler had, you know, glass pack mufflers on it, so it was really loud. And I come whipping up to the driveway and I hop out and my sister Jeannie opens the front door. She goes, oh, I thought I heard the Chrysler coming. And she goes, what's wrong with you? you? You look white as a ghost. And I said, yeah, don't mention the word ghost. And so I came in and we all sat down. And so my mom, my sister Jeannie and I, and my little sister, 
we had a big long talk about ghosts and the old farmhouse and we all finally started sharing what we had experienced so that was like the first like everyone's talking about it experience about that when i was younger i also also uh, experienced some ufo things at the house <clears throat> and uh we would sometimes my brother and i shared a room i was on the top bunk he's on the bottom bunk and we lived at the end of a gravel road and sometimes a car would at night would come down the gravel road because there's like one or two other houses down there and and you could, the headlights would shine on the wall as they turned down the road. And you could tell that was a car. Well, a couple of times, a light came out of the sky and lit up the whole room and just lit the whole thing up. So we could never really explain that. But we started looking out the window a lot. We would see a strange light. And, uh, and we ended up seeing a few UFOs. Um, one, one night, I was laying there and I had two windows facing south and one window facing west. And I was laying there looking out the west window toward the Aurora Airport and there was a light up in the sky. And I thought, oh, there's a helicopter just hanging out right up there. And I thought, well, no big deal, it's a helicopter. I'm trying to go back to sleep. And I'm laying there and I'm kind of getting freaked out, not knowing what the light is. So I. I think I went to the window and looked out the window and, and the light was still there. It wasn't going anywhere. And I'm like, well, okay, that's kind of strange. So I tried to go back to sleep and I pulled my covers over my head and, and I started getting really freaked out and the heat was like going from my head to my toes and back up to my head. You know, I was in total fear, but I, I didn't know what the light was and it was scaring me. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I, I just want to see what it is. I got to know what it is. So I went to the window and it was a semi cloudy night and a light came in closer and it kind of lit the clouds up a little bit and then it popped all the way through the clouds and there it sat and it was pretty good size. Not as, not as big as the moon, maybe, maybe the size of a baseball. And I, I was pretty freaked out, but I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Well, watch it for a while and then it went back back up into the clouds and then just went went south like it was heading towards salem and as it took off the clouds all lit up like that as it went and, it, and then it was just gone so that was one ufo sighting we had so one night i had this dream um where my little brother i must have been in my 12 or 13 and he was probably six or seven at the time we got taken aboard a ufo and it was like a smaller saucer so, um, sized ufo and there were two gray aliens in the saucer flying it and i don't remember how we got there or anything that led up to all of a sudden we're in this flying saucer but they took us for a ride in that thing and we went up interstate five all the way to portland we're going under the overpasses and over power lines and doing all this kind of cool stuff. And I thought it was awesome. And, and then we got to downtown Portland and all of a sudden shot up into the atmosphere. And, uh, and I thought it was, I was having a great time. I wasn't scared or anything, but my brother being younger, he was just a, kind of a zombie, in a zombie state the whole time. Wasn't saying anything. Anyway, next thing you know, this, wall opens up and we had our little saucer had morphed into the side of a mothership and it felt like we were sitting in one of those curved booths like at a sherry's restaurant or something and everything opened up and you could see inside the the big ship and there were other aliens if i recall and oh and i they also asked me if i wanted to communicate verbally or telepathically or mind speak, or whatever you want to call it. And I, I said that telepathically would be cool. So that's how we communicated. Well, I don't, I don't remember being examined or probed or anything like that. Um, and, but they did take me to the control board. There was this, uh, and they showed me how to run the ship. It was a, oh, it was like a big table with a glass dome or a plastic dome over the top of it. And inside 
inside of it were different crystals and they were all different colors. I can't remember how many for sure, four or five or something. And they, and they told me, I, I asked, can I fly the ship? And they said, yeah. They said, if you put your hand over this one, the ship will do this. If you put your hand over that one, the ship will do that. So they let me play around with that a little bit. And I don't remember all the details on that, but, uh, but then at one point I told them, I said, hey, I don't, we've been out here all night or whatever. And we got to go to school in the morning. We're going to be super tired. And, uh, and plus, I don't, I don't want my brother remembering any of this. I was pretty protective of him. And they said, don't worry. Your brother won't remember a thing. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll feel totally refreshed. Seems like a couple seconds later, I'm laying flat on my back in my bed. I open my eyes. And I go, wow, I feel totally refreshed. And then I remembered everything instantly. And I think I looked down at the bottom bunk. My brother was laying there asleep. And uh, it just seemed so real. And uh, to this day, my brother doesn't remember anything about it. He, and uh, so, <laughs> I, so, of course, I tell my mom what happened or what this dream was or whatever. It seemed real. And I'm telling my mom about it. And she just starts laughing at me and making fun of me. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I'm not going to talk about this kind of stuff to her anymore. Well, um, and she would tell people, oh, yeah, Jeff thinks he was abducted by aliens. Ha, 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 ha. You know, I heard that several times at family functions and stuff. Well, about five years ago, I'm at my brother's house. And we have a family get together. And my mom's there. And... And I had just taken a trip down to Roseburg where my mom and my dad both had grown up. And I went by my mom's old house where she grew up. When I was a senior in high school, my grandparents sold the place and moved up to be closer to us. Well, I was going by the house, it's on Garden Valley Road, and the guy who bought it from my grandfather was out in the yard. So I pulled up, I said, hey, my name's Jeff, I, my grand." You bought the house for my grandfather. And he goes, oh, yeah, Charlie, I remember him. Yeah, nice guy. So he goes, hey, do you want to tour the house? I'm like, sure, because he had made some improvements and whatnot. So he shows me around the house. And, and uh, yeah, I remember a lot of the things about the house, and he did change a few things. But uh, there was a bedroom on the back corner of the house that my grandfather made out of cinder blocks. And that was my Uncle David's room. And I think my mom and my mom had that room after David moved out. Well, anyway, anytime we'd spend the time down there, and sometimes they made me sleep in that room, and I hated that room. I was always freaked out. I always ended up uh, sleeping on the couch in the living room that was right next to the bedroom, but I could not sleep in that bedroom. Well, so at this family get together, I tell my mom, "Hey, I stopped by the old uh, Roseburg house and took a tour." And she says, oh, that's really cool. And I said, oh, but uh, Uncle David's old bedroom is torn down. The, the guy took it apart. She goes, oh, you mean the bedroom where I saw the two aliens standing at the foot of my bed one night? And I went, really? All these years you've been teasing me and you had this encounter? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> so everyone kind of went, oh, my gosh, you got to be kidding me. So, um so now I don't get made fun of anymore, but I uh, thought that was pretty cool. Vindication. With all this UFO stuff and aliens and abductions, uh, I always thought from a, a young age that I had this thing in my ear, way deep down in my ear, and I always felt like they could listen to my thoughts, they could listen to, you know, just listen to what I'm saying and doing and and uh, and then videos started coming out on TV about people with ear implants alien implants in the ear and, and uh, or in, under the skin and and so I got pretty uh, interested in all that kind of stuff well even like right now I can feel like either I got a bunch of earwax that needs to come out or there's something way deep and down there inside there letting me know it's there it's kind of been a little more active the last few weeks um, for some reason. And 
So one time about 20 years ago, um, all of a sudden I couldn't hear out of my ear. So I went to urgent care and they, they irrigated it and got some junk out. I think I'd been shoving Q-tips in there and stuff and kind of got it all jammed up. Well, the nurse was looking in there and, and she says, oh, it's looking pretty good. I said, yeah, except for maybe that alien implant. And she kind of laughed. I go, yeah. I, I said, I always feel like there's something way deep down inside my ear. So she says, well, let me take a, a look. And she looked as deep as she could look. And she says, you know, I actually see something kind of shiny way deep down in there, but I can't really get to it. But there's definitely something shiny in there. And I was like, yep, all this time. Pretty sure I was right about that. When my mom admitted that, um, I think it kind of just opened everything up to where, you know what? I'm not afraid to talk about this stuff anymore because I'm pretty sure it really happened. And if you don't believe me, I don't care. It was my experience. I'm not trying to convince anybody or prove anything. Um, but if you're willing to listen, I, it's fun to talk about sometimes to the right person, the right people. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'd already started getting really involved with the Bigfoot, Bigfooting thing again at that point. And um, I, I think right about that time, things really did start opening up for me. And, and as far as the Bigfooting part, I, was with, I had a bunch of friends that I really trusted and I put, I put together a lot of outings and, and um, was actually living in the Alcolt area at the time and had a lot of people over and we'd go out to the woods and I was going to Idaho a lot with my friend Jim and our, and the same group of people. And, you know, we, when I first got back heavily into the Bigfoot thing, you know, we were, oh, maybe we did bang on trees a little bit and try to do things to attract the Bigfoot to find us or, or we actually were going looking for Bigfoot. And it didn't take very long that we realized all we have to do is go out there and be ourselves, have fun, laugh, play the guitar, listen to music, whatever, and just let Bigfoot find us. And that's really when it all started happening. October 12, 2009 on Columbus Day, I had the day off of work. Um, and I found myself waking up like at four o'clock in the morning, wide awake. And so I'm on the internet looking up Bigfoot stories and videos and stuff. and and uh, having some coffee. And at some point, uh, I hear this voice in my head say, go to Bagby Hot Springs. And I went, well, I'm by myself in my apartment. And I, I'm like, where did that come from? So I got up and I went to the living room to see if a TV was on or something or radio and nothing was on. And, and I kind of scratched my head and went back to what I was doing, had another cup of coffee and and I started thinking about what I had heard, what, what they told me. And I had driven to the Bagby Hot Springs trailhead many times and did a little bit of exploring, but I'd never hiked all the way up to the hot springs. It's a mile and a half from the, from the parking lot. And I had one other time in my life had a voice tell me to do something. I was having an argument with a girlfriend and this voice said, break up with her now. <laughs> and it was as clear as those two voices were, I think the same voice, it clear as a bell. And I didn't break up with her right away. And looking back, I should have broken up with her right away. So I decided I'm going to listen this time. So I gathered my things and uh, drove out to Bagby Hot Springs. I, I get to the... Uh, I get to the trailhead part in the parking lot and I have, I think I took my video, I had a new video camera and a digital camera and I'm walking up there by myself and I'm, I'm looking at the ground, I'm looking in the trees. I, I know I'm going to see a Bigfoot because they told me to go and I'm going to see a Bigfoot. And so it took me like, it took me forever to hike up that mile and a half because I kept wandering in the woods, looking around and thinking, you know, they're here or something. Well, I get all the way to the top. Nothing happened. I didn't see anything. And I thought, uh, whatever. 
So I looked around at the hot tubs. I'd never been there before. I was checking everything out. Like, ah, this is pretty cool. And I just forgot all about Bigfoot, all, forgot all about finding stuff, and just figured, yeah, it was a nice hike, whatever. And so I looked at the big community tub, checked it out, and then I turned around and took a few steps the other way. And I look, and there they were. There were footprints on the ground. The, the, it, we hadn't had a lot of rain yet, and the ground right there was really hard packed dirt with pine needles. Well, if you had a wet bare foot and you were walking on those, you would lift up the pine needles and then you could see a spot where you would step. Well, there were several of them and two of them were really, really good. And then it, and at, at the bottom of, it was a little bit of a slope and at the bottom of the slope, there was like, it looked like something was scurrying around, running around and so the, the, the pine needles were scattered everywhere. But I had three or four or five really good footprints and I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh. And I got down on my knees and I, I actually sniffed the ground and I was looking at it and I took all these pictures. You know, pictures never do justice, especially you know, on this type of terrain. But I, I just couldn't believe it. I, you know, I actually was told to go there and found the footprints and so that's kind of really when things started opening up for me. It's like you start listening to your inner self or whatever your head's telling you and kind of put all your expectations aside. And because it seems like every time I, I, I want something to happen or I'm pushing too hard to find something, uh, nothing happens. But as soon as you just let go and give up your ego, stuff happens. And speaking of stuff happening, um, so a couple of years after that, um, I'm in Idaho with my friend Jim and a handful of other people that we knew. And we had a spot called Antler Creek. So Jim had set up this great big tent, uh, a canvas tent that he used for elk hunting when he used to hunt when he was younger. So he and I shared that tent, and we were the last tent uh, from the group, and beyond that tent was a dead-end gravel road that went back about a half mile or so. And my cot was on the back of that tent, and Jim was toward the front of the tent. Well, we were gonna stay there three nights, and the first night we all had a good time and um, had a big campfire going and um, put the put the fire out. Everybody went to bed, so I'm I'm laying in the tent on the cot, and I don't know if an hour or two had gone by where everybody was dead asleep. All of a sudden, I wake up to this huge crash. Something was crashing through the brush, just like a train going through the through the woods, and I was. And I was like, whoa, what's that? And then I heard these footsteps coming toward my tent. And then I sat up and I could hear something walk right up to the tent. And probably that close to me on the other side of the tent, I could hear this heavy breathing. It was like 15 to 20 seconds of inhaling and exhaling. And I was like, oh, he's here, they're here. And then I, I decided, well, maybe I'm supposed to lay back down because it was just standing there for a long time. So I laid back down and then whatever had walked up the tent, walked around the tent in between a bunch of other tents and walked into our camp. And at the same time, you could hear the little pitter patter of little feet running down the gravel road and coming into our camp. And, and you could hear the coolers being opened and closed and things being touched. And you could hear all kinds of noises like they were checking out all of our stuff. Well, that happened all three nights. The, I didn't hear the crashing noise anymore, but I, would, I woke up the next two nights to the big guy walking up to the tent and the little ones running in. And after the little ones ran in, I could hear them playing with the coolers and stuff. I just went right back to sleep. Well, the second night, the, the, the big guy comes out, little, little ones run in. I'm like, cool, they're back. I go back to sleep. 
And at some point in, in the night, I'm having like a dream within a dream and I'm, I'm kind of paralyzed and I, and I know there's something going on and I don't know what's happening to me. And I'm, I'm seeing my DNA. I'm like riding like a roller coaster over my DNA I, and things are all weird. I don't, I don't know what's going on. And, and I feel, I'm trying to wake up. I'm trying to push myself awake, like must wake up. I want to know what's happening to me. And I feel somebody stroking my hair and saying, everything's okay, Jeff. You're going to be fine. Everything's fine. And, and I also feel something really soft on my left cheek. So I fi I'm finally able to like become unparalyzed and, and, and conscious. And I reach out because I know there's something there or somebody there. And I reach out and I f feel a finger. I put my hand on whatever this thing was, a finger of a person there. And the finger probably stuck out about that long because I remember grabbing it and it probably was that long. And I thought, that, it feels like a female. And then I held her hand like that and she still, the soft thing up against my cheek was her right cheek. And she's stroking my hair saying everything's gonna be okay. So I, I pull my head back and I look and I can see the side of her face and it was a female Sasquatch. And then I went right back to sleep. Next day I get up and I'm one of the first people up, make some coffee and stuff. And then there's some, a couple other people get up and we're chit chatting. And then all of a sudden, like a rush, I remembered that whole dream or whatever it was. And I went, oh my gosh, you guys, everybody, you gotta hear what happened last night. So, so uh, I told them what happened and nobody else had experienced that. But uh, usually when Jim and I are in the tent together, we share the same experience, but that one was personal for me, I guess. And then uh, another night, big guy walks up, little ones run in, they run into the camp. I fall back to sleep and, and then I, I get woken up by these strange lights swirling around all over the place. They're like orange and reddish, yellowish lights. All I can see through the tent all these lights I thought what the cops are here what are the cops doing here so I I open my eyes I put my glasses on and I'm looking around and I'm like what in the world's going on there was just all around the tent you could see swirling lights everywhere so I look out the front of the tent and our campfire had started up all by itself there were two flames they were side by side I call them the dancing flames and they were just doing this side by side going from three feet up to 10 or 12 or 15 feet and coming up and down and doing all this stuff. And so I, I go to Jim, I say, Jim, wake up. He's like, huh? I said, Jim, our fire started by itself. And he leans up and he looks out the front of the tent. He goes, oh, it did. Well, we both sat on our cots, which seemed like 15 or 20 minutes. We both kind of agree on that, on the time frame. And we watched these dancing flames. None of us decided to get up and go outside and check it out. You know, we just sat there and watched it until eventually the flames went back down to nothing and it got completely dark. And then we both went right back to sleep. In fact, Jim said I was already snoring before the flames went out. I said, no, I thought you were snoring before the flames went out. So uh, about a year later, Jim and I would communicate quite often. We'd call each other like once or twice a week. And, and uh, about a year later, I called him. I said, hey, Jim, remember the dancing flames? He goes, oh, yeah. We, we talked about it quite often. And uh, I said, there's more to that story. He goes, yeah, there is. And I said, what did you see? He goes, well, tell me what you saw. I said, well, it wasn't just dancing flames. There were two huge black 10-foot tall objects walking around the flames in a clockwise manner. And I know they were physical bodies because every time they got between the tent and the flame, it would block the flames out. And there were two of them. It took us a year to process it and actually 
admit it and say it to the other person. And so the fact that we both saw it, and I think we're, we're about 99% um, had the exact same experience except, except the very end where he said I was already snoring and I thought he was already snoring. So that was pretty cool. And then at the same camp uh, during the day, uh, a bunch of us were sitting in chairs around the campfire. We didn't have the fire going, but we were just sitting there. And there was actually, there was an outhouse behind me. And you know how an outhouse, when you walk up to it, there's a, a wall like this. We have to walk around like this and go in. And above this part of the wall was a cutout about um, like that. And Jim's going, like, he goes, I don't want to say anything, guys, but, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, he, a couple of the, two of them, uh, Jim and Maggie, were both like, and I turned around and I didn't see anything. He goes, there was a Bigfoot, a young Bigfoot looking through the, the window thing, watching us. I immediately jump up and run toward the outhouse and the creek was on the other side of a gravel road on the other side of the outhouse. And I run up toward the creek and I could hear something splash through the creek and take off through the woods on the other side. It was gone so fast. And I jumped up and I was there in seconds. So, so they had a daytime sighting there during this whole camping trip. And then another day, one of the gals didn't want to use the outhouse because it stunk pretty bad. So she went for a walk up the creek to do her thing on the gravel road. And she said as when she got done doing her thing and she pulled her pants up and stood up, she gasped. There was a Bigfoot standing in the creek drinking like this with his back to her. And she said when she gasped, it stopped and it over the rushing water of the creek, somehow he heard her or was, uh, was aware of her and it, she said it stood up and just psh, took off. So we did have a couple daytime sightings during that, that trip. I found a place uh, out past Bagby Hot Springs, which I call Camp Broken Arrow. And I had a, I had a lot of gatherings there with, with a lot of folks. And I took Joe Beeler out there one time and he thought it was just wonderful. And anyway, uh, a, a friend of mine from Bend met me up there one time and we just spent one night. He slept in the back of his forerunner. I slept in the back of my pickup and we were pretty close to each other. And anyway, I, I, during the night when I was sleeping, I had that same kind of a dream where I felt like I was in, in a dream inside a dream and I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. I was trying to wake up and I couldn't move and I was fighting through it, fighting through it. And I could tell I was being brain scanned again. I didn't see the DNA, but I know I was being brain scanned. I just felt it. And I wanted to say something and I, I couldn't even get, a, I couldn't utter anything. And as I fought through it, fought through it, I finally said, yeah, I love you. <laughs> and uh, which was kind of, I don't know why I said I love you, but I was, I imagined there was a male Sasquatch standing up side of my rig and then in my head I heard I have done this once before but now I must go that means he had brain scanned me once before and we're hundreds of miles away from where he did it before because I'm in Oregon at this point then so so that morning after we had coffee and stuff I was talking to my friend and I told him what happened and he said you know what I heard some buzzing noises, vibrational noises coming from your truck, outside your truck last night. Camp Broken Arrow one time, I took a friend there and we spent a couple nights alone up there. And the whole time we were there, it was dead quiet. There were no birds, no, the, the, the wind wasn't blowing, no squirrels, nothing. Just every once in a while, maybe a Learjet was flying overhead, heading towards Salem or something. But it was super quiet. And 
pretty uneventful. Uh, it was fun, but uneventful. And and we had to pack up our stuff that this that one morning that we were getting ready to leave. Packed up the rig. And I said, wait, we got to go sit on the stump and say goodbye. Because there was, there was a big stump on, on the edge of the camp that overlooked this new growth uh, forest that was growing. And so we sat on the stump. I said, well, guys, thanks for letting us be here, but we got to go now. Uh, and as I go into my goodbye speech, all of a sudden we heard what sounded like machine gun wood knocking from two different spots. We heard this back and forth, back and forth, which went on for like 35, 45 seconds, something like that. And, and as, as we heard the sound from here to there, we're like watching a tennis match going like that and like that and like that. And it was loud as can be. And we got done, we looked at each other and went, okay, they let us know they were there. And uh, that was that was something else. No, another uh, another cool thing that happened. Um, I was driving in my Jeep and I was going to the store. And I pulled into this parking lot. And I this blue flash appeared out of nowhere. And I was like, "Holy smokes, what was that?" And I looked looked around, and then my phone rang. And it was a friend of mine from Oklahoma who's into the Bigfooting world. She calls me and I say hello and she just starts talking and she says, you know, I have a Bigfoot that I call Blue that I communicate with down here. And every time before I see Blue, I always see a blue streak or a blue flash. And she called me right after I just saw the blue flash. I can't explain that one. There's a connection. I, okay, just because there's a Bigfoot in eastern Oklahoma and one in the Mount Hood National Forest, I think they're, they're connected too. So one time I was by myself driving to Camp Broken Arrow and I remember the exact spot I was at and this name popped in my head and I, I'm pretty sure I remember the name Meridia. I think it was Meridia. And I was like, what the heck? Am I supposed to remember this? So I, I remembered that name. And then I was talking to a friend of mine sometime later, and she was talking about a female Bigfoot named Meridia. And I went, that name popped into my head on my way to Camp Broken Arrow that one time. And uh, yeah, I had forgotten about that one. That was pretty cool. And then one time I, I took the same friend from Oklahoma with another friend of mine to Camp Broken Arrow for a couple nights. And we had stopped in Estacada first and there was a second hand store and we decided to kind of rummage through there and check it out. And my one buddy says, hey, check out these saws. And I'm like, oh crap, we're gonna need one of those. So I bought a bow saw. Well, the two previous weeks, I had been going to Camp Broken Arrow with woods, uh, loads of wood, good campfire wood, and stashed them underneath some tarp and hid them out of the way. And as I was coming back out of Camp Broken Arrow down the narrow road, I asked, I asked them, could you like make sure nobody comes and takes my spot? Because next weekend I'm bringing a couple friends. So after I bought the bow saw, we're cruising through the woods, through the Forest Service Road. There's a small tree about that big across the road. Right in the same spot, I asked them if they could make sure nobody could come into the spot. So I, I jumped out and sawed that thing away, and my, my friend Greg was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how did you know? So that was pretty cool. Tom Powell, he's a Bigfoot researcher. He speaks a lot at conferences, real funny guy. I spent time with him before, great guy. Anyway, he wrote a book called Shady Neighbors. And the basis of that book, I believe, is the report of, of the baseball field, the Little League baseball field in Yakult, Washington, right next to the post office. 
somebody reported that a Bigfoot walked out of the woods into the outfield during a game and tons of people saw it. And so that, so you get a picture on the cover of Shady Neighbors of a Bigfoot standing in a baseball field in Yakult, Washington. So I lived in Yakult, Washington for a few years, um, had a house out there. And one reason I bought that house is a few years before that, when I started getting totally back into Bigfoot, I would get online and I would read people's encounters. And I read about an encounter out past Yakult where these two guys were coming home late at night and they saw this streak in the sky, like a fireball, and they thought maybe a small plane went down. So they parked by these train tracks, the only spot they could find wide enough to get their truck over, and they got out and one guy went down the train tracks one way, the, one, the other guy went the other way. One of the guys came back first and noticed by his truck, his buddy had already come back. There was somebody standing by the truck. Well, a moment later, the other guy comes running down the train tracks, all bloodied and stuff. He, kept, he was running fast. He's falling down and hurting himself. And he's like, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. There's something big and huge out there. Well, it turned out whatever was by the truck wasn't the other guy. So I thought it was a pretty cool uh, encounter. So I went out one day and found it. I found the exact spot. And about three or four years later, here I am owning a house just down the road from that sighting. My house was 42 miles from work. And one summer morning I got up and I'm driving down the road. I have to go down a real windy road that follows the East Fork of the Lewis River. And then, and then it connects the main highway that takes you into battle, uh, battleground. Well, the road I was on went straight and did some curves like this and then straightened out again. Well, I'm looking down the road and there's something big and huge on all fours running up the road straight toward me in my lane, but quite a ways away. And I was like, what the heck is that? Is that a horse? Nope. Elephant? Nope. Uh, llama? Nope. Dog? Nope. And I'm like, I don't know what this is, but then I have to hit the little curves like this and I lose sight of it for a few moments. And then it's, it's chugging up the road and I could see it, it front legs were just, looked like elephant legs to me, just, but they were just moving so fast. And it wasn't complete daylight yet, but it was pretty light outside. And, and I thought to myself, we're either gonna run into each other or it's gonna take off down one of these driveways before I catch up to it. So I let the turbo kick in and, and took off faster. And it, on a dime, just hung a left turn into this driveway. And I'm slamming on my brakes and I, have, I pass the driveway and I throw it in reverse, I back up and up the, the driveway went up a little bit of a slope and there was like tr trees and bushes on each side of the driveway. So it was a little bit darker inside the driveway area. But I backed up and I looked out the window and I could see what looked like a dog man. Its rear was facing the road, but it had turned its body so the head was looking at me too. It was kind of U-shaped. And it was giving me this look like, ha, 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 you can't catch me. Or mocking me or something. And I, I, could, I couldn't see it super clearly, but it was definitely darker than the darkness in the driveway. But I could make out the body easily and, and the snout and everything. But I, it gave me the creeps. And I got the blank out of there. I, I wasn't going to stick around or go look. But the, the, the way it was looking at me, like, ha, ha, ha. Taunting me or something. So I got to the coffee shop right by my post office I worked at, and I got like three or four of my buddies on Facebook Messenger telling them what just happened. And one of my friends um, hooked me up with a guy named Vic Cundiff. And he's, I guess, an expert on Dogman and stuff like this. So I talked to him on the phone for a while, and he said, Jeff, I've I could imitate his voice, but I won't. He said, Jeff, I, uh, I believe you had a real dog man sighting. I would give advice to people if they're 
having questions or they're scared or they don't know who to talk to, just uh, watch some YouTube videos. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people who have content and YouTube channels that, uh, that will listen to your story or they'll read it out loud and share it with people. And if you find somebody that you trust, and just reach out and it, you don't have to share your story right away, but just uh, do some research and you'll find that other people have had the same experience or something very similar. And then you'll find out that you're not alone and there's other people out there that, that can give you some advice and help you through it. There's a new YouTube channel called Talk About Strange and Steve does a really good job of sharing people's real intimate information about paranormal Bigfoot and stuff like that. And uh, if you watch one of his uh, videos you, and, you, and you trust him, you can get a hold of him and, or just watch some of those videos and read the comments that people are li leaving on his channel or other channels like that. And you'll, you'll get a lot of information and, and help and and, and then when you finally find someone you can trust, just reach out and share your story. And, you know, we're all, we're all kind of uh, looking for answers. And there's a lot of resources out there if you just let yourself find it.